Uh, and uh, if you've never seen this book, this is uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Bluefield's Orchard, uh, a seminal read, an excellent uh, story of everything. Of, if you just wanted to get a book to enjoy about the whole fungal kingdom and really strange aspects. Uh, and the speaker tonight is the author of this book, and, and that's uh, Dr. Nicholas Money, who is a professor of botany uh, at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. So I, I, I only in recommending this book, I'm sure he will provide any background, but I think we should move ahead with that right now. And uh, Dr. Money, if you're ready, then we will share your screen and you're on and I'm off. Sounds, sounds good. And, and thanks for the for the plug for that book that was published in 2002. It was a work of, of, of youth, of great youth. And now grizzled I am before you, many books later, filled with wisdom, a lifetime of learning. I'm going to talk about um, a different entheogen today. I'm going to talk about alcohol produced by yeast. It's actually interesting, isn't it? That, that we, we, don't, we don't classify alcohol or ethanol as, a, as an entheogen, but there we go. We'll talk about its mind-altering properties in a few minutes, perhaps. So, so what I thought I'd do, um, the title of the presentation, and thank, I appreciate the invitation. I'm, I'm so sorry that I can't be in Washington, D.C. Where, where I live close to Cincinnati. I, I'm a professor at Miami University, and um, it's been a lousy year for mushrooms here. We just haven't had much rain, so I'm actually supposed to do a foray a week from now, so I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to get get a lot of rain before then. But uh, no, it's uh, few and far between have been the, the, the interesting fruit bodies in this area. So I'm going to talk about the rise of yeast and its relationship to the fall of Homo sapiens. So there's, there's, there's good stuff and there's um, even better stuff, which is, is, is wiping our species from the face of earth, which is, which is a laudable goal, I think, uh, should be for any deity. Um, what I'm gonna do is, is, I've got some slides. I don't have many slides, I've got some slides. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut this up into about six sections. And so I'll, I'll introduce some ideas and then I'll break and I can answer some questions if there's some, um, uh, if any occur to you, and if not, I'll, I'll go on. But I'm going to talk about the importance of yeast, um, the deep history of yeast, a bit, little bit about brewing and baking, the beauty of yeast or the lack thereof compared with the wonderful fungi that we've just been looking at that have been collected from the woods around you. I'll talk about the fall of man. I'll talk about the selfish ape. And I thought I'd end up with talking a little bit about the research that I did some years ago on spore discharge in mushrooms, just because it's still, I still find it inspiring, the mechanisms themselves absolutely inspiring. So I thought I'd talk about those. So let me see if I can share my screen here. And then I'll, um, if, if I have any, we, we were having some Wi-Fi problems earlier. If those pitch in, we'll take a brief break and then I'm just gonna use my iPhone as a hotspot and that should enable us to communicate. Is that good? Everybody's frowning. Oh, this is really good. I, I, I'm teaching at the moment. I'm, we're, we're, this is our second semester where we've been teaching remotely. And so that's, that's sometimes it's difficult to tell. Are the students there to begin with? Are the students receptive? Are they interested? Are they, um, yeah, the, the lack of feedback is, is difficult for a narcissist like me. All right, let's go to this scare. scare. And so tell me if there's, uh, if there's a problem. Rise of yeast and the fall of man. Ching. Oh yeah, before I go anywhere else. Um, so in the last few years, I've been writing about a number of different issues within biology and the social sciences. And I haven't been so engaged in thinking about the fungi but um, I was surprised by the image that was revealed on my iPhone. It's going to be in the second slide that convinced me that I need to get back to studying fungi as swiftly as possible. So here we have a sunrise clicking away on my iPhone. Bam. Clearly 
the meaning of life lies within the fruit body. What was I thinking? What was I thinking? Beginning to, to be interested in bacteria and viruses and other kinds of microorganisms when the answer surely lies with, with the fungi. So, yeast. So, I won't say so again. In the beginning, when I was 18 years old, I got fascinated by the fungi. I went to college. I was the result of uh, affirmative action in the United Kingdom. I didn't grow up under um, particularly privileged economic circumstances, but I got to a good university in Britain, which was the, uh, um, one of the great fortunes of my, my, my young life. And I fell in love with the fungi because I fell in love with the professor. The guy's name was Mike Madeline, and he taught an introductory course. It was one of the first university lectures I'd ever heard. He just introduced me to this world that I, had, I really had no idea that such glories existed in nature. And so I was 18 years old at that point, and in a sense, I never looked back. I've spent the last uh, 40 years, given that I'm now 58, I can do the math, um, studying fungi in one way or another. And yet it wasn't until very recently that I think I really recognized that Saccharomyces cerevisiae was actually a fungus. I've studied fungi for 40 years and then, oh, yeast, yeah, it's kind of an afterthought. And there's actually a lot of reasons for that. For those of us that have called ourselves mycologists during our careers or in our um, you know, as, as, as um, mushroom lovers, as people that love collecting mushrooms in the woods, amateur mycologists, we call ourselves mycologists. We don't tend to be that interested in the biology of yeast. And similarly, molecular geneticists that have studied yeast for, for more than the last half century spend their lives working on this single cell fungus. They never refer to themselves as mycologists. And if you're unfortunate enough to go to academic meetings of mycologists, which you should never do under any circumstances, you won't find yeast biologists there. And vice versa, if you travel to a yeast conference, and there were many before shutdown, you won't find people that study mushrooms and you won't find people that refer to themselves as mycologists. So there's this profound cultural difference that exists within people, among people that, that love fungi and those of us that have studied fungi for a living. And that's my excuse for not really being that interested in yeast until somewhat recently. When I started work on this, this book, though, a couple of years ago, the significance of yeast in human affairs was, you know, immediately apparent. So it was, you know, light bulb going on. So we've got our entheogen there. Alcohol produced by Saccharomyces cerevisiae in a glass of red wine. Every drop of ethyl alcohol, ethanol, on the planet is produced by Saccharomyces. Actually, almost every drop. So there are a few kinds of bacteria that will produce ethanol or alcohol. I'll switch between those two terms. And actually, plant roots will produce ethanol under unusual circumstances when they're starved of oxygen and they'll produce traces of ethanol. But that, the vast amount of ethanol on the planet, and there's a lot of it, is produced by yeast. If you look off to your right right now and look in, in look, look that way. It's probably my left or your right, it's my right. If you look in that distance, what you're looking at is the center of the Milky Way galaxy. I can assure you of that. I know exactly which direction the center of the Milky Way galaxy is in because I'm a, I'm a professor. I know these things, right? Well, right in the middle of our galaxy, there's a giant molecular cloud called Sagittarius B2. So this is a birthplace of stars. Using spectrometers, cosmologists have detected massive quantities of alcohol in Sagittarius B2. Because alcohol, this is a small molecule. It's a small organic molecule. There's a, there's a ton of it up there. In fact, there is enough to fill 10 to the power 28 bottles of vodka in Sagittarius B2. Now, it would take us 
millions of years to reach Sagittarius B2, traveling at the speed of the Voyager spacecraft. But in, in my idle moments, I could imagine NASA putting together a, a, a crew, a space mission to go to Sagittarius B2, and they'd, they, they would, the astronauts would have to be alcoholics by, by, by nature, I think, because you know, the, we're going to go and we're going to find the mother load of alcohol in the universe. So, so um, especially during shutdown, since we're all, according to uh, The Guardian today, we're all, all drinking, was it 19% more alcohol every week because of, because of uh, the, the shutdown? I think in my case, it might be more than 19%. But anyway, the only place you're going to find ethanol um, other than on Earth produced by yeast is in Sagittarius B2. There's probably other places in the cosmos where you can find it. But I found that interesting that it's a, it's a simple molecule that's generated in vast quantities within the galaxy. But here on Earth, the thing that produces it is Saccharomyces. So that's the first thing. It's kind of important to... Um, our economy, alcohol, if you think about brewing and all the wineries and all of the jobs that are dependent upon alcohol sales. Yeast is also used for raising dough. It's incredibly important in the production of baked goods. If you go down the aisle in the grocery store and look at anything in a box and look at the ingredients list, there's yeast in there. Doesn't matter if it's leavened or not, yeast is in absolutely everything, which raises some, some interesting cultural issues that I discuss in the book. Um, Marmite and Vegemite, if you've traveled in, in uh, the United Kingdom or places like Australia and New Zealand, this is a, a confection that people there spread on toast. And I grew up in Britain, I've lived in the States since 1986, but my mom tells me that that was one of the first solid foods that I ate was Marmite. So it's this thick, black, salty paste. It's a byproduct of the brewery industry because it's a sludge of pure yeast. It's yeast in its purest form. Um, I still love it. I, I, I have no idea if it's good for you or not. I mean, it's rich in B vitamins, it says on the label, but uh, there you go. You can, if you buy it in a, in a store in this country where they specialize in European foods, they'll charge you six or seven bucks for a jar. They almost give it away in, in, the, in the United Kingdom. It's very, very cheap. So what have we got? We've got drink, we've got food. Um, in the United States, um, well, I'll talk about Ohio. Every time I gas up my um, fleet of vehicles, um, up to 10% of the gas that I, that, that I pump is, is actually, 10% of the fuel is ethanol produced by yeast. So they don't even have to label it. That's by federal law. Up to 10%, you can, you, can, you can put that in a fuel blend. And most gasoline that you buy in the United States contains something around about 10% yeast ethanol. So it's eth corn ethanol that's produced by yeast. And I'll talk about that industry later. This particular pump you can see here, it's actually listing the percentage of um, biofuels that are present in um, in the gasoline. But as I say, you, it doesn't even have to be labeled. So our, our, our automobiles and, and bus fleets, many of them, and so forth, they're running partly on, on, on yeast ethanol as a fuel. Um, what else here? Um, half of the world's synthetic injectable insulin is produced by yeast now. Novo Nordisk, the uh, Danish company, holds the patent on this. It's their most lucrative product. Um, the other half of injectable insulin is produced by the bacterium E. coli, and Eli Lilly had the um, original patent on that. But as I say, incredibly important product. Yeast works as a wonderful platform for expressing human genes, and it is literally the human gene for insulin has been inserted in genetically modified into yeast, making it a genetically modified strain of yeast and this yeast cell will chuck out insulin, okay, which is then purified and uh, sold in this form. Um, the last thing there, Floristur is a probiotic supplement. Um, this is actually pure yeast. It's a particular strain of Saccharomyces. Um, apparently, according to um, the literature, this is just about the only probiotic for which there's peer-reviewed placebo-controlled double-blinded trials that show that it works. So apparently, from what I've read, there's good evidence that Florista actually works. It's used to treat 
um, traveler's diarrhea, for example. So if you drink contaminated drinking water, as, as, as I've done on too, too many trips, um, this apparently will sort of reformat your, will, will reformat your digestive system and will reduce the symptoms um, of, of diarrhea, which is pretty, pretty significant. So I actually haven't tried it, but um, I'd be interested in testimonials about that. If you add all that up, as I did when I wrote the book, that accounts for about a trillion, you can't make this up, can you? A trillion dollars of um, economic activity in the United States. So I'm not sure what the size of our economy is right now. It was probably a bit bigger um, nine months ago, um, but about $20 trillion or thereabouts. That's the size of the US economy, biggest in the world. About 5% of that, $1 trillion is, due to the, is, is based upon the activities of yeast. That is an incredibly important um, product. It, it probably accounts for the, it's probably related to the um, employment of 3% of the US workforce. That's more than twice the number employed in car manufacturing sales. So yeast is our most important microorganism. It is vital to our economic activities. It's, it's, it's essential as a food source. Um, in my case, as a psychiatric crutch through, through red wine, and, and I'm probably not the only person on earth that would, that would say that that's, that's true under the, these, these circumstances. Um, yeast may become even more important. So just in the last few uh, months, there have been a couple of papers published. I'm looking at my notes here. Um, so yeast is being used in coronavirus research. Um, one thing you can do with yeast, which, is, which is, makes it a, a very useful um, tool for molecular genetic research, is you can, it'll do this naturally. You can chop apart a genome. You can chop apart lots and lots of, you can chop apart a long length of DNA. Okay, like the genetic information retrieved from a virus. Now, coronavirus is an RNA virus, but 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 nevertheless, you can chop up these this this um a long length of um, uh, DNA, stuff it into a yeast cell, and the yeast will begin to lace it together. Will actually begin to create. You can make it do this to actually create an artificial chromosome out of all of this material. So they've actually done this with the coronavirus genome. And they've actually got yeast cells to produce fully, it's, they say, seems fully functional coronaviruses just by, 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 by actually transforming them with the um, coronavirus genome. So you chop up the, the, the genome into lots of little pieces, stuff it into yeast. Um, yeast will use the, the, the methods called the transformation associated recombination. All the fragments are stuck together and the cell starts chucking out um, yeast proteins, at least things that, that um, uh, uh, immune systems will react to. I shouldn't have said fully functional coronavirus particles because I don't think that's the case. Um, they're also using yeast to express different proteins for, from coronavirus in the hopes of, of um, generating pure proteins for vaccine development. So coronavirus has got these things on its surface called um, spike and envelope, and these are different proteins. What's the other one? Um, membrane, and, 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 and you can get yeast to produce these. So it's very, very important in molecular genetic research. So that, that's the first pitch here, is that yeast is important for us. Maybe I'll go, go just one step, step further here, and then, then we'll break for some questions. Yeast has been important for us since the get-go as, as a species. This tablet is in the British Museum and it shows the beer rations for um, Sumerian workers. So this was unearthed in uh, what's now Southern Iraq, 5,000 years old. And if you look at those, um, the, the, the upturned triangles there, they're, they're actually um, beer pots. You see them and they've got, got a neck. So, so you've got the triangular bit and then the neck there's, if you look on my screen, it's at the top left, you've got one. And if you look toward the, what are we, second row, second from, from the right, you've got two of them. This apparently, um, this was put, uh, this was inscribed in this fashion to indicate to a, to a manager on a work site what the beer ration was for his workers. So they were working on a ziggurat or, or, or um, one of these, these Mesopotamian pyramids. And he must have said, yeah, the guys that are working on the steps 
um, down low. Yeah, just they only get one beer ration. They really, in fact, you should just fire them. And those that are working higher up on the temple mount, yep, they get two beer rations today. That was the purpose of this tablet. But um, I can see from your expressions that all of you are fluent in cuneiform and you can read this and you, you, you can see this very clear, clearly. 5,000 years old. However, we need to go back 105,000 years to find the earliest evidence for probably the earliest suggestions for the use of yeast in brewing. So there have been sto stone tools that have been unearthed in Mozambique in Africa that are pitted with little starch grains. And under the electron microscope, after 105,000 years, you can still tell which plants they came from. So somebody was using these stone tools to pound or grind plant material that left these starch grains pitted into the stone. And those starch grains, it turns out, come from two different plants, wild sorghum and the African wine palm. Sorghum beer is still hugely important yeah, local commodity in, in different African countries. This suggests that, that people 105 years ago, I suppose they may not have even been considered mono, mod, modern homo sapiens. They could have been one of our hominid relatives. I mean, we, we wiped them out shortly after that, but it could have been, could have been something else, some other organism, subspecies, relative that was actually working with these stone tools. We can't be sure, but they may well have been grinding them produ to produce alcoholic beverages because it turns out that it's very easy to do, do that, at least in to produce a, a liquor that's got about the same concentration of alcohol as, as, as bottled beer. So if you take um, tissue from, talk about, well, I'll talk about the wine, wine palm. If you extract a sap from a wine palm and you put it in a jug, or if you just put it in an upturned turtle shell or a calabash back then, 105 years ago, and leave it, leave it out in the sun, it'll ferment and it'll, it'll, it'll turn into um, uh, uh, a palm-based beer. They call it palm wine in um, different parts of the world. And indeed, people still do this. They'll tap wine palms. There are actually a lot of different species of palms that can be used for this purpose. And they'll take that sugary sap. They'll allow yeast to ferment it naturally. And then they'll have their alcoholic beverage. So last point before I take a, take a break and ask for questions about yeast is that Claude Levi Strauss, Strauss, very famous um, anthropologist from France, had to be from France with a name like that, unless he manufactured genes. Um, Claude Levi Strauss in the 1970s wrote about the, what he thought was sort of the most important transition in human history, which was from nature to culture. And there is a wealth of archaeological evidence that shows that around about 10,000 years ago, many human populations gave up their nomadic lives in favor of living in small settlements. We see the beginnings of cereal agriculture. And what Claude Levi Strauss said in the, in the 70s was, the reason that we did that had to be because of brewing. That it was the human thirst for alcohol that drove us to begin living in settlements and to begin to cooperate in larger groups. And the reason for this is that it takes a family or it takes a village to tend a vineyard or it takes a village or a big family to grow cereal crops. And that's one thing that nomadic groups cannot do. But if you stay in one place, you can uh, grow these, these commodities and produce fermented beverages. And he said that really it was this thirst for alcohol that really drove our um, decision or decisions by different groups of people to begin living in villages, to give up the nomadic life. And so that's why I say that yeast is just so important for human civilization. And there is abundant evidence, by the way, that alcohol came before leavening bread. 
So that was something that we learnt later. I'll end on that. The first leavened bread, the first time uh, yeast was used to, to, to make bread dough rise, for which we have yeah, decent enough evidence based on hieroglyphics, was in a, ancient Egypt. It may have happened before then. And um, probably what happened there is that, that the yeast escaped from foam on a, on a, on a, on a beer vat. They were already brewing beer um, all over that part of the world. And probably yeast was just transferred in what they call beer balm, caused the dough to rise. And you can imagine that the, the, the first baker that saw this would have been astonished by this, this loaf that was inflating. What the heck is going on here? And then became fabulously wealthy when he found a market for this, this leavened, puffier, lighter bread. Uh, the Romans, it took the Romans a while to, to, to adopt this. Pliny the Elder writes about um, brewing and baking in, in a good deal of detail, but um, he said that the, um, you know, in the Western, um, in, 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 in the Western Roman Empire, so about one, uh, yeah, in the early ADs, leavened bread was really beginning to, to be introduced. But, it, but if we look back at the Roman Republic, it was it was unleavened bread that was the was the staple for for for, uh, for Romans. So it was introduced later. So that's the first part of this is just to say yeast is important in our lives. And why don't why don't I take a few questions if there are any, and then we can continue with with, with this. So going back to the beginning, someone had a question of how the ethanol got into Sagittarius. If it doesn't really occur naturally here without fungi to produce it, what what's going on out in space? Yeah, I mean, so it's it, it it's the it's the there are very energetic, non biological chemical reactions that are going on in places like giant molecular clouds. It, I mean, the thing is, the ethanol is probably here, there, and everywhere where in the universe it's a small, um, it's a small compound. It's probably generated quite easily as long as carbon's available. Now, actually, having carbon around is, is a problem because um, our sun, for example, is 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 far too weak to produce carbon on its own. To create carbon, you've you've got to have you've got to have at least at least a, a star collapse or two and some supernovas to or a supernova to generate carbon. So presumably that's gone out there. But if you've got carbon and you've got Plenty of energy to drive chemical reactions. This is this is what's occurring. That's not a very good answer because I don't know. But when we get there, when we get there, we will reach Sagittarius B2. There's so much ethanol alcohol on Earth. I don't think we'll be be going out there. If we ever ran out, we'd 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 be off to the giant molecular molecular cloud with our wine glasses, saying, "Please." Are there are there other animals that consume alcohol? Yes, that, that's great. So in, in, uh, in my uh, book, The Rise of Yeast, I talk about the pentailed tree shrew, which, which, is, which is an incredible animal that um, uh, uh, drinks a great deal of alcohol, but doesn't get drunk, and, and for very good reasons. So there are some animals in nature that actually drink a lot of, a lot, lot of ethanol. Getting drunk in nature is a disaster. You're surrounded by predators. You're surrounded by spiky plants. If the pentailed tree shrew got drunk, it would be, be curtains. And and um, certainly, as a younger man, when I misbehaved, it, it, this wasn't a good good way of, of of ensuring one's survival. Right? If you drink too much and fall over, and bad, bad business. So so we 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 survive by virtue of our our friends as as young people. Um, I'm not suggesting for one moment that anybody ever drinks any alcoholic beverage, by, by the way. I have to say that. Um, where was I? There are other animals that, that, that drink um, alcohol. So they will, there, there are many descriptions of elephants, for example, eating fermenting fruit and being attracted to it and supposedly stumbling around. But um, a group of, of zoologists from the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom have refuted a lot of these stories. They, they, they're very skeptical that an animal as large as an elephant could ever get as enough alcohol from fermenting fruit to start stumbling around. So all of these sources are provided in the, in the book if you care to read about this. But the, the, um, 
most triumphant is the pentailed tree shrew that I, I think in a single day it will drink. Uh, what did I what did I calculate? It was dr like drinking a drinking a, drinking a whole bottle of red wine and then having a couple of cocktails. So it's a little animal and and but anyway, it's got incredible detoxification um, systems in its body. So it, I mean they never seem to stagger around. Fruit bats get drunk too because they'll 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 eat fermenting fruit sometimes but there are people throwing some other examples in the chat apparently there's a good video of a moose eating fermented apples somewhere yes, I've seen the that. <laughs> my zoologist friends tell me that couldn't happen but you see the videos and it seems pretty straightforward yeah. doesn't it so I've, I've seen it with, with birds too I've heard that like I've heard lots that of too. parrots will, will eat fermented fruit um, can you talk a little bit about how important beer and wine was for early cities as a source of something clean to drink? Yeah, that, that's interesting. So that's often been put forward that that's why people people drank because it was um, because it was a safe beverage. Um, I've read there's actually been quite a lot written about that. So, you know, you look in, you know, Shakespeare's London, people never drank any, never drank any, any water, but there's no real evidence they were doing this knowingly for health reasons. It was rather that the water just um, was disgusting. It was, it, it smelled bad. And so at least when it was processed in, in, in a brewery, it would be more, more palatable. And also it was then a good source of calories too. So it's some, um, as I understand it, the people that have studied this, um, the, the, the evidence that we, we drank alcoholic beverages really as a, as, a, as a precautionary measure, it really isn't supported. I mean, we didn't understand the infectious basis of disease. We didn't understand germs. In, I mean, well, I mean, the cholera outbreaks in what, the 1850s in, in London and the, the solution there being John Snow was the, um, the sort of father of, of of um of of public health um and he figured out that it was wells that were contaminated with feces but he didn't at that point know anything about the cholera um microorganism the bacterium that causes cholera no evidence of evidence at all so people probably did may, maybe they they yeah I, i've said what i know that, that they they avoided it because it smelled bad and clearly you're not going to drink a glass of water that's you know brown with fe feces but they didn't know necessarily that that was poisonous someone wants to know about the lifespan of yeast how long can depends they what you mean i mean is, is it's the eternal microbe it's at this point you know um it's at this point it's um a hundred million years old and it's in its current form just it's kept budding that's an interesting question it's more philosophical than biological um, let me, I can show you a picture. Let me show you a picture and I can answer that question. Here we go. This is for all of the mothers in the room or future mothers or people that have mothers. Um, these are yeast mother cells that have produced buds. So if you look at the <coughs> largest of the cell and she has got all of these, these pock marks on her surface from which she has seeded buds. So she has reproduced through that bud, bud, bud scar to produce a daughter cell. And so to answer the question about the age of it, a yeast will, an individual yeast cell, that mother cell, she might well be a week old at that point. She's produced a number of buds and after a few days. So we're talking about, I mean, I don't know what the maximum is. It's a little bit longer than a week, I think. But after, after a few days under optimal conditions, she'll begin to, um, begin to decline and so that's sort of the lifespan of, of an individual yeast cell is a few days. But what you're looking at there in, in the picture then are a series of mother cells and their daughters, and they're all cl they're clones, they're genetically identical. And so the life of that clone might well be on the order of a very, very long time, if, if, if the conditions permit. So it's, there's, there's, there's different answers to that question. The reason that we call them mother cells, you know, we, 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 we apply um, fe feminine pronoun to, to, you know, there she is. Um, there's, there's no real reason for this. There is no gender within yeast. There, are a, there is an A strain and an alpha strain in Saccharomyces, um, but they bud. They will actually fuse and produce ascospores. So they're like morels in that way because they're related, they are ascomycete fungi. Um, but there's no way in which you can, you can really apply 
animal gender terminology to to yeast cells. They don't have what we'd regard as sex chromosomes or anything like that. It's another issue. So they do reproduce both sexually and asexually, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. And asexual reproduction, it turns out to be very, very important for um, in the bioethanol um, industry, but it'll take a while to get into that. Yeah. There's a couple other questions, but I want to make sure you get a chance to cover what you wanted to cover. Yeah, I've got two or two or three hours of material here, so. <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll try and wrap up around nine. Oh, I better move on. I better move on. Am I getting a question or am I going to continue? No, why don't, why don't you keep going? I'm going to race you I'm going to race you down. I'm going to race you down. I can do it. Our sort of official end time, Nicholas, so, so keep that in mind. Okay. okay. This is past my bedtime anyway. I get up at five in the morning, so this is, I'm normally fast asleep by now. Um, where was I? Next thing is to say is to look at this picture, which is, as I was saying at the beginning, mycologists don't study yeast. If we think about, you know, you may, most of you have probably been asked this question, which is your favorite fungus or which is the one that you find most beautiful? There's no shortage of beautiful fungi to look at. Yeast is very minimalist. This is actually the, I think this is the most beautiful photograph of yeast cells that I've ever found. So I had to get this and get copyright. It was actually taken by a researcher in the United Kingdom called Catherine Cross, um, a biotechnologist, but it's a, it's a scanning electron micrograph of yeast cells and it shows the cells in their plump, um, fully hydrated form. It is a gorgeous image. But they're not that pretty to look at under the microscope. I mean, under the light microscope, they're, you know, little circles, very tedious. Compare that with something like a powdery mildew. So I've always been a fan of, of microscopic fun, fungi since I got interested in them, uh, as I mentioned in my autobiographical introduction. Um, I've always been interested in, in microscopic fungi. This is a beautiful image from, um, the, um, why do I always forget the name? The Selecta Carpologia Fungorum that was published in the 1860s by two Catholic brothers, um, Charles and um, um, the other one, the, the Tulane brothers. The Tulane, I forget the name of the other brother. Charles and, anyway, will come to me. And so they were French mycologists in the 19th century and they wrote about um, microscopic fungi like these powdery mildews that grow on plant leaves. Louis René was, was his name, the other brother, for all of you taking notes. Um, and they're gorgeous. They, these pictures, I've written about them in a number of my books just because they're mesmerizing. They're, they're, they're almost, I don't know, hallucinogenic in there. I mean, their ability to capture, capture these micro, microscopic things in three dimensions in there drawings that would then turn into these plates. Absolutely gorgeous pictures. But if you're interested in the way that, and I'm going to talk about fungal movements briefly in a few minutes. If you look at the beauty of the fungi like this, and all of you have got your own examples, and then you compare that with the simplicity of a yeast cell, it's sort of a difficult thing to fall in love with it, 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 it structurally. So then it's another reason that those of us that call ourselves mycologists, we're, we're aesthetes. We, 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 we're, we're, we're admirers of the artistry of nature, just in, 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 in its, its, its visual appeal. I don't know what that means, but it sounds good. Um, the artistry of nature, it's, it's, it's visual appeal. Yeast is one thing and it's many things. So I've, I've talked about yeast in th this, this evening. And I've always been referring to one species or one fungus that's regarded as a single species, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that was first identified properly in the 19th century and, and named. But there's actually 1,500 different species of fungi that grow as yeasts. 1,500 species that have been described, have been given a Latin name. So the yeast diversity is immense. Um, I wanted to mention that. And in the book, The Rise of Yeast, I talk about some of these other yeasts. There are some really beautiful yeasts. There are predaceous yeasts that, that attack, um, attack insects and other invertebrates. Um, there are beautiful yeasts that live in the slime trails left behind 
uh, slime molds, uh, just, just beautiful, beautiful organisms that happen to grow with this yeast form rather than as filamentous hyphae when they're, when they're um, growing. When they're growing, when they're growing. Okay. Now to the fall of man. Now to the bad news. All been great so far. Um, essentially, it's a very straightforward message, although it seems to be one that's very, very difficult to get across. And um, you heard it here first from me. Homo sapiens, we're hurtling towards 8 billion of us, um, and the planet is absolutely doomed. It will be scratched back to its, its well, the whole biome, the, the whole biosphere won't be destroyed, but absolutely, we're, we're out of here. We're out of here. This is, we are incommensurate with the survival of the planet, as I describe in my uh, book, The Selfish Ape. Where does, what role does yeast play in this? Well, in some ways, we look, as, look upon yeast as our savior. And so this is a photograph of a, uh, a yeast bioethanol plant in Missouri, Missouri. Um, we have them not that far from me. I live close to the border with Indiana. There's bioethanol plants there. Um, there's, there's a lot in Missouri and, and a good deal further, further west, actually. And so what happens here is that genetically modified corn is converted, or the fruits of genetically modified corn is converted into bioethanol. And it's a very, very energy intensive process that actually liberates free sugars from corn so that they can then be fermented in these giant fermenters in this, this picture here the ones with the little conical tops and actually then the ones, ones with the, uh, the sorry, the, the, the flat top ones, those are the fermenters. Um, so that they can then be fermented by, by yeast to produce high concentrations of ethanol and the ethanol is used then as our, as a biofuel. So we see the, the, the bioethanol industry would like us to view this as mankind's savior, right? We've put, a great deal of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels. What better way to save the planet than actually working with carbon neutral fuels like yeast produced bioethanol. So here's, here's how this works. The bioethanol industry would like you to look at everything and only everything to the right of the corn plant there. Forget the thing on the left. What this shows is, this is, the, this is a pitch for bioethanol. Corn plants in the Midwest absorb carbon dioxide from the air, drawing down carbon dioxide from our atmosphere. They use the energy in the sun, the photons that pour onto the surface of Earth to produce sugars through photosynthesis and corn stores them in the form of starch. We need to get that starch out into sugars that can then be fermented by yeast, which is the, the arrow to the right of the corn cob there. And the yeast produces ethanol, just as it does in um, brewing. When we burn ethanol in our cars, when we drive around and we're burning that biofuel, carbon dioxide returns to the atmosphere but there's no net increase in carbon dioxide. So if you can compare that with fossil fuels, this is a beautiful, beautiful future here. We can meet our energy needs by using yeast to produce um, biofuels. We needn't keep relying upon oil and natural gas. The problem is, the problem comes when we look at the piece of information to the left, which is the amount of energy that largely comes from fossil fuels to actually grow corn. That's the biggest problem, but it's not the only one. And when we burn those fossil fuels, then that increases the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So modern agriculture, I mean, you, 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 you don't see this where you guys live in the sophisticated part of the United States, but where I live in the, what used to be the flyover part of the country, agriculture is highly mechanized, huge, um, I mean, they're beautiful to look at. They're, they're wonders of engineering 
to see these harvesters that do everything that, that pick corn and process it, you know, the, the, the size of an aircraft carrier that's, that's, um, I, I exaggerate, but very, very large farm vehicles then that are harvesting corn and they are, you know, in a sense that they're, they're miraculous, but they're burning a lot of fuel. I mean, some of them they'll actually run on biofuels, but they're burning a lot of fuel to harvest corn. Um, there are many, many other issues. Actually getting those sugars out of corn is very, very energy intensive. It is, this is not carbon neutral. It, it's, it's extremely, um, that bioethanol plant that I showed you, this, this, this is not, you're not looking at car, a carbon neutral future there. Um, the other thing is that the amount of grassland that we're clearing to produce, um, uh, to, grow bio, uh, to, to, to grow genetically modified corn. It, it's immense. I mean, there's a study published in Nature a couple of years ago. Um, Percentage-wise, we're, we're clearing as much grassland in the lower 48 as percentage-wise in terms of, yeah, percentage of grasslands disappearing. It's sort of on a par with the deforestation in, in South America in terms of how much land we're using. Unless you actually live in these parts of the country and you see this happening, you're unaware of this. Now, most of that grassland was used as pasture. It wasn't, you know, primary growth grassland. There's only scraps of that left in, in the middle of the country. But nevertheless, this was, this was productive grassland that was used for, for um, animal agriculture in many cases and uh, comes, comes with its own, own issues. But the, but the yeast um, is not our, our savior in these terms. And the problem is there's just too many of us, right? There's too many of us and we've got marketplaces that open all the time across the globe and everybody wants to live like um, a wealthy American and drive cars and have air conditioning and so forth. And um, this talk isn't about climate change, but uh, um, it's not looking good. Yeast is actually even worse than that. It gets so much worse than that. Well, this is the interior of a yeast cell. Another beautiful picture, an electron micrograph showing the interior of yeast cells. And yeah, I think I can finish this by nine. Um, the, 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 the structures within those cells, if you look at the bottom left, they look like colanders, don't they, for straining vegetables or, or pasta. That's it. Those are actually, the, on the left, that's the imprint that's left by the, the nucleus of the yeast cell. And those little dots then, the actual holes in the colander, those are the nuclear pores, gorgeous structures. So we actually know more about the way that yeast cells work than we know about pretty much anything else on the planet. I mean, we know a lot about the way that the bacterium E. coli works. But the thing is, as a model for human biology, yeast is, is the way to go because it's a eukaryote like us. Its chromosomes, its genetic material is housed within a nucleus. Just like our genetic material is housed in nuclei in our cells. So they work like human cells. And yeast has become an incredibly important model for studies on, on, on human biology, looking at, at cancer biology, for example. Um, I've mentioned the way that yeast is used as platforms for the, for, the, for the production of different pharmaceuticals. It's because you can stick human genes in these cells and they'll, they'll, they'll produce human proteins. Fantastic. Trouble is though, that with all that technology comes some risk. So I've mentioned where I live. I live in Ohio and I, I love Ohio. I've actually lived here for 25 years. One thing during the 25 years that I've, I've lived here, um, we see particularly, or I see um, evidence of in the areas where corn is grown. Um, it's, it's not so labor intensive, right? It's highly mechanized today. Communities have been ruined by mechanization and um, the levels of drug addiction are astonishing or have been in, in many communities in Ohio and elsewhere. And as a country, our addiction to opioids is, um, is a problem. So we've got latex here that's weeping from an opium poppy. And what was that number I had? I had an impressive number somewhere about. Anyway, a lot of that latex that comes out of there I forget the mass. It's 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 ten or twenty percent of that is is pure morphine that comes out of a out of a, an opium poppy. So that's the natural way of producing 
opioids, 12% morphine. And you can take that, that, that um, morphine and with a very, very simple chemical reaction, you don't even have to be as smart as the guys on Breaking Bad. You can create some um, heroin very, very swiftly. Any, any good chemist could explain how to, how to do that. So you can do this naturally. But here's the, one of the real horrors with the, the uses to which we're putting yeast. Synthetically, to produce morphine and heroin, it's a multi-step process. It's extremely difficult to actually do this in, in the lab, which is why it's easier to let opium poppies do it. All but one of the steps in that biochemical process have been put into yeast cells, genetically transformed yeast cells. As far as I, I know, there's one step that's a pretty complicated chemical transformation that hasn't been introduced into yeast. If that were done and we had a yeast strain that would carry out this biosynthetic process, you've then got the prospect of homebrewed heroin. And that's the way as a species, I think we'd walk ourselves most swiftly into the fossil record. There's a huge bi 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 um, uh, pharmaceutical interest in this because um, opioids are used for all kinds of things in medicine, incredibly important. And of course, um, uh, opioid, um, opioids for as, as painkillers, extremely important, extremely useful as prescription drugs, absolutely. Um, but the idea that we might create a yeast strain that would do this in the lab would mean you could just take a bucket with um, molasses that you get from the grocery store and instead of using that to brew beer i know it's a little bit more complicated than that but you could mix in your your genetically modified strain of, of yeast and you could literally create you could create um homebrewed heroin in a relatively short period of time so this isn't good um there's also possibilities that yeast can be used to create biological weapons so there's a lot of fear about this um, and I talk about this in some detail in the book about the, the genetic um, technology that's being used to transform yeast. All right, how much time have I got? I've only got 12 minutes. This is crazy. I've got hours left. Hours and hours of slides. No, I don't. Um, I put this slide in because I like it. Why did I put this slide in? I, I guess in a sense, just to say that, that um, there's a little bit of irony in all this since we're very fungal in, in, in nature. So the ancestors of all animals probably look something like the cell on the, the right there that actually has the tail and the little cone coming off from the base of the, the cell. That's a coloflagellate, a coanoflagellate. That's the group of single-celled organisms that seems most closely related to the common ancestor of the animals, all of the animals, including us, of course. The other cell is a fungal zoospore produced by a chytrid fungus that swims through water. They're found in all aquatic environments. They use exactly the same propulsive mechanism. They share a good deal of their genetics. I, mean, I know that you're, you're aware of this as mycologists. Um, that we share a common ancestor. The animals and the fungi share a common ancestor and um, we're far more closely related to the fungi than we are to any other group of organisms, far more closely than we are related to plants or seaweeds or anything else. I'm still not quite sure why I showed you that slide. I suppose it's just something like, I, I know, that this is it. We were born from this same stem a billion years ago, plus or minus six or seven weeks a billion years ago we came from the same ancestor fungi and coanoflagellates and thence to thence to the animals um and i think we were doomed from the get-go if, if you've been smart enough back then a billion years ago and i bet there were some aliens out there on you know, close to sagittarius b2 they were calculating how long it would be for us to develop all this technology and wipe ourselves off the planet so that's um that's that that's what i have to say that's what i have to say bye bye homo sapiens um is there is there grace in all this i think from from the extremely bleak view that i have of our future um unalloyed in its bleakness 
you know, I, I can't watch uh, David Attenborough on TV, right? The most famous TV naturalist ever. It's, just, it's like, it's awful. It's just, no, I, I don't need to see more evidence that we're screwed. I, say, I, I look out of my window. It's, it's so obvious. Um, from this see seemingly bleak view, though, why is it that I, I, I smile a good deal of the time? Um, I think it's a possi possible, and you've all done this for yourselves, to, to awaken a deeper appreciation of non-human nature. Once you start to realize just how awful we are as a species, I think it drives us back to look at the fungi and other organisms and say, look at the beauty in nature. Look at the sheer unlikelihood of being alive and having enough of a brain that I can look at the environment and, and, and try and understand what else is going on here. Um, Grace, I think, also may lie in recognizing that we won't be missed. I should end there, but I'm not going to because Oh, there we go. There's Sagittarius B2. No, that's a view of the, the Milky Way. There we are. Yeah, I should have done that when I was giving my encomium on. From this seemingly bleak viewpoint, we can indeed. There we are. The pale blue dot was um, made famous by, by the great Carl Sagan. The last picture of Earth, it was sort of half a pixel of Earth when, when, when uh, Voyager 1 was um, 6 billion kilometers away. What is going on on that planet right now, though, is far more interesting than you can read in the Washington Post, which ruins my every day because it's the first thing I look at every morning at five in the morning. Oh, oh no, how awful. Read this book if you, if you want to be uh, momentarily depressed and then filled with, with the glories of nature. Here we are destroying everything very swiftly. I had more slides than I, than I remembered. Here we go. So on that pale blue dot, look at this. Flip over a mushroom the next time you're in the woods. If you're really, really good at this, I mean, if, if you take the time and you get the illumination right, this is a beautiful photograph and I didn't take it. But if even if you use a hand lens and a magnifying loop 15x, especially with a 20x, if you can get the light just right and, and, and you can look at the gills, you can actually you can actually see the spores, the base cilio spores projecting from the surface of the gill. You won't see any detail, but you can see a lot of information there. And that's the thing. A mushroom seems to be the embodiment of sluggishness. But a good few years ago now, um, I collaborated with a, a very distinguished mycologist. She's now at um, University of Wisconsin, Ann Pringle, who may well have spoken to your, your group. She's really, really brilliant. Um, we collaborated and we, we tried to figure out how it was that spores are launched from mushroom gills. Now, people had studied this for more than a century, but what we had and no one had had access to before us was high-speed cameras, video cameras that can run up to a million frames a second. They're uh, astonishing. Talk about the technology of corn harvesting, but high-speed video is, is astonishing. And so with this technique, we were able to actually look at, and you can find, find this online and you, you'll find things on YouTube. If you can't, I can send, send me an email and I'll send you some links. Um, we could actually watch spores being shot from the gill surface. And, and an average size, an average size, a, a mushroom like a um, field mushroom, an agaricus, um, sits there in the meadow. It's releasing 30,000 spores a second from its gills. It's an astonishing mechanism. And so we played a small role in figuring out how this happens. So we're by no means the, the, the only scientists that have worked on this, but we were the first ones to actually see it. That was a pretty good day in the lab, actually seeing the spore jump for the first time. That's, that, that's a privilege. Yeah. Um, uh, I remember talking about this, this a few years ago. I was in Canada, I was in Alberta, and the guy that was some squiring me around um, during that, that visit to, to Alberta was a sanitary engineer who happened to be, a lovely man, sanitary engineer who happened to be an amateur mycologist. And, 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 we, 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 and I was showing him some of these, these videos on my, my computer one afternoon. And he said, so let me get this straight. <laughs> while, I was, <laughs> while I was up to my neck in in, 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 a, in a what? In a, in a latrine, in an, in an outhouse, right? This is his job. You were in a lab in Ohio studying mushroom, mushroom spores being discharged into, into the air. And it was at that moment in my life that I realized that I am Marie Antoinette. 
that indeed I will be guillotined and 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 it should be done. How ridiculous! It's it's it's, it's unfair. He, he he dealt with shit for a living, and I got to do this. It's not fair, is it? It's not fair. We laughed a good deal, though. He's a very good-natured man. <laughs> um, what was I saying? Yes. So we figured out how it works, and this is how it works in this diagram. It is shown in. In, in enough detail, there's the spore. The spore sits on a stalk. So imagine that's sticking out sideways from a mushroom gill. And what happens is that it's very moist under, it's very high humidity underneath the mushroom cap and water begins to condense on the surface of the mushroom spore. And it condenses in two different places. It forms in a drop that we call Buller's drop to commemorate the great A.H.R. Buller, the greatest mycologist that ever lived. and. Uh, I'll take no other interpretations. He was the Einstein of mycology. And also water then that developed on the, on the adjacent spore surface. They increase in size until they make contact. Um, like two droplets of water that are moving down a window pane, right? When they, when they touch, they snap together. So saving in uh, surface free energy. It's exactly what happens here. So that droplet snaps onto the spore. This is happening on a time scale of millionths of a second and kicks the spore into the air. It's a change in the center of mass. You can imagine somebody suddenly throwing a huge, I don't know, a, 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 a medicine ball at you. Your, 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 your center of mass, your combined center of mass is gonna change really quickly. And that's what makes the mushroom spore jump off the gill. So I, I still find these problems in fungal biology mesmerizing, fascinating, and it, and it really, you know, was my privilege for many years to be a research scientist um, working in the lab and actually studying these fungal mechanisms. And, and now that I spend much more time writing than doing sort of serious research like this, I still think about the fungi and they are a durable source of inspiration for me. And I shouldn't think that will ever, well, it changed at some point when my brain is no more cognizant of its surroundings than a boiled potato but and until then i'm gonna i'm gonna love the fungi and i do have another short book it's the sort of follow-up for the selfish ape that will be published apparently next march in london yeah it's, it's going to be here in um, university of chicago press too in which i do talk about there is a chapter in there i talk about fast movements in fungi but in this this book i take it chapter by chapter across the entire time scale of nature from um, quantum events all the way up to billions of years. And that's all that we know that exists in nature. And it's in this succinct and inspiring book available in all good bookstores that we still won't be able to visit next March, but presumably the Amazon packages will continue to arrive, keeping us all abundantly happy. Wow, that's it. Excellent. And then you, you also have a have a book called The Rise of Yeast as well, right? Which you mentioned a couple of times. Yeah, and I didn't I didn't show the chapter. I didn't show the the um, cover for that. That book has sold so well. I don't want you to buy it. I'm, I'm it's made me so independently wealthy. Please don't go out and buy it. I'd, I'd rather you didn't. I don't need the money. <laughs> How do I get rid of the screen share here? I don't know. Uh, I can turn it off. Yeah, she can take care of that. I did it. So questions. Yeah. There we um, go. So I, I have a question about the the um, spore dispersal pictures that you just showed, and it made me wonder about yeast and how yeast gets into the air for all of these, you know, natural brewing processes that people do, where they're just capturing yeast mm -hmm. from the air. That that's actually one of the one of the most insightful questions that a human has ever asked of yeast. <laughs> Maybe about, about anything. Um, so the deal is that yeast Saccharomyces is unusual, that it doesn't get airborne very easily. And everybody assumed that it did. And so there have been some really interesting studies. So you can use molecular techniques to figure out what's in our air supply. And samples of, of air from places like I don't know, vineyards and so forth. It's very, very difficult to isolate yeast from the air, Saccharomyces from the air. 
The only place that a group of European researchers could really isolate yeast Saccharomyces easily was inside a winery and inside a brewery where you've got just all of this material that's being shed from the surface of, of um, uh, the equipment, you know, brewing and, and winemaking equipment. There they could find it, but naturally yeast doesn't get airborne. What it does though is it gets moved by insects. And so that's, I talk about that in the book, that what happens is that um, yeast is not good at being airborne at all unless it's inside a wasp. And so there have been these beautiful studies of um, uh, wasps in Tuscan vineyards, for example, and they find that the guts of those wasps are full of, full of yeast cells. And so those wasps are attracted to rotting fruit. Yeast use the, uses, in nature, yeast uses the, um, the wasp as a vector to get from fruit to fruit and then this is exactly what um, yeast, I mean, yeast does ferment and produce ethanol in nature. It's just that we have coerced it to produce massive quantities of eth ethanol in our breweries and, and vineyards. But it's the whole study of yeast and its, its, its transmissibility, the way it gets around is really, really interesting. And it, historically, it's neat too. It traveled with us. So you, you look at the, the migration of human populations, for example, in the, um, in the, in the Near East, in the Fertile Crescent, and you can actually see yeast moving with populations. So what was happening, they were taking it on their, um, th their, their um, tools that they were using for, for growing vineyards and uh, they, they were carrying it themselves. In, in so, some, they were so carrying for, it in the, in the drink they took with them too. So for things like lambic beers or sourdoughs that are using wild yeast, is it more that the yeasts are in the material that is being left out to ferment and not that it's landing on that material from the air. So it, it's complicated. Sourdough is fascinating because it's actually not Saccharomyces. It's not the same yeast. It's a different yeast. That's actually not true. It's a combination of yeasts and um, a bacterium, a lactobacillus, so a lactic acid um, bacterium. It's absolutely fascinating. So the microbiology differs. This is what's interesting about, so if, if you create wild um, palm wine for yourself, which, which is done in countries like you know, Ghana, for example, you'll actually put an upturned, or you'll, you'll, you'll use a jug now, right? But you could use a calabash. You put your um, sugary sap, your sweet um, liquid in that container, and then you just allow it to ferment. What's really interesting is that this has been studied. In fact, the best studies were done in uh, Cameroon, I think, and some of the, yeah, you know, Cameroon, there's some studies done. And um, what happens is all kinds of wild yeast show up from the air because they're airborne. And there are insects that are coming and they're depositing yeast and the thing begins to ferment. And what you've got to begin with is this rich garden of many, many different species of, of yeasts. And then Saccharomyces starts to increase, probably brought in by, on the, in an, by an insect, fruit fly, something like that, or a wasp. And it begins to increase. It's a minority, it's a minority. And then bam, it increases and all the other yeasts die. And that's what it figured out how to do 100 million years ago in its evolutionary history. It said to itself, if I can produce more ethanol than anything else, and I can avoid being destroyed by it, I've got the greatest poison on planet Earth. And that's how it survived. And it did this. It did this by duplicating its genome, um, genome duplication event, started producing masses of ethanol, was resistant to ethanol. I mean, it, it wasn't thinking about this from step to step, but this is the, the beauty of uh, the Darwinian solution to, to life. But that's what happened. So the wild stuff will happen. But if you expect, um, and there's the other thing, of course, with, with, with sourdough is that we, we share starters, right? The French would call it Levain or Levain, Levain. And, and, and there you've got Saccharomyces in there. But yeah, sourdough is not, it's not primary. It's actually a species of candida and a lactic acid bacillus, a bac bacterium that uh, carries out that fermentation, which, which is what gives it that really sour flavor. Yeah. And on that note, someone asked, you mentioned um, that alcohol to drink came much before bread did, but you, it, what do we know about the timeline of when we started making bread? Um, so, so the, well, ma making, making leavened bread. Right. 
the, the earliest, as I understand it, the, the earliest evidence which comes from hieroglyphics, so on the walls of tombs in, in ancient Egypt. So it's, it's back there, uh, I don't know the number, 6,000, 8,000 years ago, 6,000. I mean, it, it came after alcohol because we know that, I'm gonna make up a number, 2,000 years BC, so 4,000 years ago. I know there are hieroglyphics of that age that show um, the, the, the process of bread making that appears to suggest that it was, it was leaven. Um, and certainly a lot of beer brewing going on at that, that time. Um, but now alcohol goes back much, much further. They've, they've got evidence in, in archaeological finds in parts of China now that go back, oh, just an immense period of time. And they were making al alcoholic beverages in, in Chinese settlements that were, I mean, the figure for us becoming a sedentary uh, uh, species, everybody says 10,000 years, but, you know, th th there's some flex in there. These things in China, I think, are quite a bit older than that, but, you know, not an order of magnitude older. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, we love alcohol. We're, we're quite good at we're quite good at dealing with it. Um, we have we, and that that actually differs by ethnicity to some degree, but also just sort of more personal genetic history that that we 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 we're quite good at degrading alcohol. We have the the, the requisite enzymes to break it down so that it doesn't just destroy us. And of course, you've probably got friends that, you know, suffer terrible hangover, hangovers, even if they have a small amount of alcohol, because they're not genetically um, set up in that fashion. Some would say blessed, some would say cursed. I mean, it, yeah, absolutely. Makes you wonder how we got away with prohibition. Not well. I mean, nothing. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I agree with that. Not well. It's the war on drugs, uh, redux. Yeah. So... Any other questions uh, in the queue, Elizabeth? That's all, that's all the questions from the chat. All right. Well, I, I think it's probably time to say good night. Uh, Nicholas, uh, Dr. Money, thank you so much for your very talented, wonderful tour through the universe from Sagittarius to the uh, to the yeast at the bottom of our glass. It was a, a wonderful experience, uh, and I think we would all say good night finally, and thank you for making this a wonderful evening for all of us.